Hi, everyone. Welcome. Welcome, welcome. We're so excited that you're here. Last session of the day. You made it. I hope you are excited about um, joining us for this session and this workshop. We're glad you're here. We would love to know where you guys are from. So feel free to put your, your city in the chat. Let us know where you're coming from. And um, we're excited you're here. And we will get started officially a few minutes um, after 3.30, just so we can give um, everyone some time to get in here and start joining us. Um, as I'm sure some people are, are rushing after their last one. So we'll we'll wait just about a couple of minutes. So if you guys wanna share your, your city and where you're from in the chat, that would be great. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome, welcome. Oh, yay, Miss Nympha is going to join us again. She was with us last session. Hey, everyone. Hi, Miss Dora, one of our board members. Go ahead and put your city of where you're from. Give us an idea of which city you represent. Thank you, Ms. Ninfa. I'm glad you're loving the information. I've got lots of notes too. If you're just now joining us, um, we'd love to see where you're from. So if you could just put your city in the chat. Um, it just gives the presenter and myself an idea of what we who we have in the room. And we will get started in just a few minutes, maybe just a minute. <laughs> it's great seeing everybody. Well, seeing your, your names. <laughs> I don't get to see your faces. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and start going over just a few housekeeping things, and then we'll get started with the presentation. We're so glad you're joining us for this great session um, all about parliamentary, parliamentary procedure. I always say, I always mess it up. Um, you guys are going to, you guys are in a treat with, for your speaker today. She has so much knowledge and so much expertise to share with you. My name is Tabitha Butler and I work for the city of Fort Worth in the communications and public engagement department. And I am proud member of the community engagement office, um, who's helping put on, who is putting on this conference. And so we're gl so glad you're here. Hope you're learning a lot. As a reminder, on the right-hand side of your screen, you're going to have the two, uh, the little bubbles up there, the conversation bubbles. That's for the chat. So just enter um, any comments or feedback there if you need to. Below the bubbles is a guy in front of, or a girl in front of a little chalkboard. Looks like a teacher. That's where you're going to put your questions. So. Throughout um, the presentation, if you have questions for Mary, if you'll type them in this uh, question box, we will try to get to them at the end of the presentation. And then if you look a little bit below that, there's three little people. That's where you can see all of the presenters. And then you can see everybody who's joined you for the presentation. And if you see somebody that you want to chat with, like I'm going to pick on one of my neighborhood leaders I work with, BJ, if I wanted to message him directly, then I would just click on his name and I could send him a message. And then Mary has also graciously provided you um, with parts of the present with the presentation for after um, so you can reference it. And it's where the three. Um, sheets of paper are that's going to be your files so just make sure that you're using the chat to give some feedback but also using that little question box so that we can um, answer your questions at the end of the session and so i do also want to remind you if you want to make your screen bigger at the bottom of your screen on the right hand side there'll be um, a box 
that has some openings, you just click that to toggle to full screen. And so that'll make your pre the presentation um, bigger so that you can see it um, better. So enough of that housekeeping stuff. You've probably heard this spiel four times already and know what you're doing. So I am excited to um, turn it over to and welcome um, our wonderful Mary Kaiser. She is our city secretary for the city of Fort Worth. And she is going to be um, giving you so much great information today. So I'm going to pass it to her. Well, thank you, Tabitha. And welcome, everybody, for the last session of the day. And we're going to talk about parliamentary procedure. I'm probably one of the few people that gets really excited about parliamentary procedure. So, um, but I'm going to start sharing my presentation and we'll get into it because it is, um, I've got a lot of information to share. So we want to. Oops, let me try that again. Okay. All right, there we go. I tried to click on something else. So uh, we're going to talk about um, really some just practical tips for holding successful meetings. And we're gonna use parliamentary procedure for fun. I know you don't think it's fun, but it is, and efficiency. So, um, and I've, I've done this for a long time and I can tell you that if you use some of the tips that I'm gonna share with you and some of the, the rules out of Robert's Rules of Order, it really will help you have a much more efficient meeting. And then they can be a little bit more fun and they are not such a chore. So let's get right into this and um, so first of all, what do you need for a successful meeting? And I'm talking about a meeting of your neighborhood association where you're going to have 25 people in your living room and you're having a, you know, a, a neighborhood association meeting. Or if we were all here for NUSA and we were having a big meeting to, you know, um, you know, to your, like your annual meeting. All of these rules work for either size meeting. So they're, they're applicable to anything, you know, that you, that you're, you're working in, you know, a church meeting, any other volunteer organization, they're, they're valuable for anything. So first of all, you need some rules on how you're going to conduct your business. So that's where Robert's rules comes in, plus some other local rules that you might adopt. You need a well-prepared agenda. That's your roadmap. Critical for a good meeting. You need enough time for an effective meeting. You need to look at what you are trying to accomplish and estimate how much time these things are going to take so that you don't try to, you know, have an hour long meeting that really you should have set, you know, an hour and a half or, or two hours for. You need an engaged board. You need the, you know, your board of directors or your, you know, president, by your executive team, whatever you want to call it. You need engaged members. And then you need a good record of what you did at that meeting, which is your minutes. And we'll talk about that. And then you need a plan for your next meeting. So it's just a, you know, it just, you know, just keeps going around. So let's talk about running the meeting. First of all, you want to start on time. That's critical. You know, you ask people to take time out of their busy schedule to come to a meeting and you're, you want to start on time and you want to ensure that you have a quorum, whatever that means for your organization. You want to move down the agenda in order. There are some times when you're going to want to take things out of order and we'll talk about that, but pretty much you want to go down the agenda in order. You want to communicate, if you are the chair of the meeting, you want to communicate with the rest of the board and with your audience so they know what you're doing and why you're doing it and, and anything like that. And you want to be consistent. You want to run your meetings and set your agendas up the same way each time so everybody's ready to go and they know what you're going to do. So why parliamentary procedure? You know, everybody thinks that it's really complicated. It's just going to make the meetings go longer. Well, not necessarily. First of all, it provides you some structure and some consistency. It protects the minority, and we're going to talk about that in a minute. It allows for free and impartial debate in a reasonable amount of time. That's where some meetings can get off, can really get off track because the debate just goes on and on and on, and there's no way to stop it. And it also, it does save time. It is very, very efficient. So let's talk about how it provides you some structure and helps you manage the meeting. It's much easier to conduct a meeting when everybody knows what the rules are. They know how to get recognized so that they can speak. They know how to make a motion. They know what motions to make. 
and, and how the chair is going to handle routine matters. And then, you know, wait, wait, it's, it's moving too fast and um, we're repeating ourselves. Those things can happen in a meeting and, and this will help you get some control over that. So um, I talked about protecting the rights of the minority. And so uh, a decision that's made by a group who listened to the minority is usually far better than one made by a group who ignored or ridiculed the minority. And what I'm saying here is you may have something come before your organization that 80% of the people on, in the organization think it's a really good idea. You got 15 or 20 percent that maybe don't think it's such a good idea. That's your minority. But you want to make sure that you hear them because they may have some valid points that someone else hasn't thought of. So you want to make sure that they're heard. And by using parliamentary procedure, you ensure that everyone's treated fairly and you hear all sides of the issue and that the rules are the same for everyone. And so that's how you're protecting those rights. And let's talk about debate. Debate is the discussion regarding a motion that's out there. You decided that you're going to, you know, a city council could have a motion out there to, you know, to buy a fire truck. And so it's the debate that, you know, is out there on that motion on whether to buy a fire truck, in, you know, when are we going to buy it and, you know, how much are we going to pay for it, all that sort of stuff. So that's what debate is. So, under Robert's rules, you want to have free and impartial debate, but you want it to be reasonable in a reasonable amount of time. So, Robert, if your group has adopted Robert's Rules of Order as your parliamentary authority, it says you can speak two times for 10 minutes, no second speeches until everyone has spoken that wants to. So that's what, you're, that's what the rules are. But you can change them. You can adopt local rules that make more sense for your organization that you could modify it to say that you can only speak for five minutes, for example. Still, you can't speak the second time until everyone else has had their first opportunity to speak. And I've seen this particular thing in practice at a previous city that I was in. The, um, the mayor was, was a registered parliamentarian, and so he ran a very good meeting. That's how I, how I learned that this is good, makes good sense. And we had something that was being discussed that was quite controversial, lots of opinions, and um, we were keeping up with who, who had spoken the first time and in, in, in that. And one of our council members you know, had rung in to speak for a second time. And the mayor looked at him and said, this will be your second and final opportunity to speak. Do you want to take it? And he changed his mind and decided he would wait and let a few other people speak before he came back in again. So it does make a difference. And he waited and then he did, he did eventually speak. But you want, you know, it just makes it, um, it's reasonable. And it saves time. And just, you know, for saving time is, um, it's efficient. And there's some time, there's some things that you can do um, that you can use a consent agenda. If you have a number of things that are fairly routine, uh, perhaps it is, you know, approve your minutes from the last meeting. Maybe there's several reports that are non-controversial that everyone's had a chance to read. You can put all of that on a consent agenda and handle it with one motion. You can use unanimous consent also on something that's not controversial, um, <clears throat> which means that without the, the chair would have something out, you know, to, to vote on that's fairly non-controversial. And you would say, um, you know, perhaps it's uh, that we're going to break for lunch at one o'clock. And he said, well, you know, with um, hearing no objection, then, you know, with that, you know, well, under unanimous consent, then we will agree to break for lunch at one o'clock. Uh, the correct use of tabling. Um, the correct use of tabling is that something more urgent has come up that you need to handle ahead of the item that you're on, and you would do it within the same meeting. Something else has happened. Uh, perhaps there's a report later in the meeting that's very critical, and the person who is presenting that report, something has happened, and they are going to have to leave at a particular time. And so you can table the item you're on, bring that one up on the agenda and handle it to allow that person to then be able to leave to take care of their other item. And then you go back to the item you were on. So that does save some time. You can postpone to a certain time if you have something that um, it's not fully baked. And then these things happen in a meeting. 
So you decide, you know, we really don't have enough, enough information, so we want to postpone it. But it has to be to a certain time, to the next meeting, until 6.30 p.m. Perhaps someone else is going to be available at 6.30 that can help, or until the finance committee reports back on this. You have to put some sort of a time period on there. Oh, excuse me. And then one that you want to keep in your back pocket is postponed indefinitely. This is a very handy um, motion in Roberts that allows you to kill something. It's already gotten into debate. And what you're doing is you agree not to decide. If something is out there and no matter if you make a motion to approve it, it's not going to be good. You make a motion to deny it. That's not going to look good. There's just no graceful way to get out of this, this thing. You can postpone it indefinitely and it just goes away. So that's a, a handy one to have. You don't use it very often. It's, it's not something you use very often, but it does come in handy um, <clears throat> for certain items. So, so there's 10 commandments of parliamentary procedure and I'll go through these fairly quickly. First of all, the organization is paramount to the individual. You're working for the good of the group. You know, if you're a city council, you're working for the good of the city council. If you're a neighborhood association, it's the good of the neighborhood. You know, whatever body that you're representing. All members are equal. Nobody is more important than the other. Everybody, you know, it's all equal. A quorum must be present to conduct business and take legal action. That's gonna be stated in either a law or a rule or your rules of procedure what your quorum is, and that quorum has to be there before you can take action. And that also pre protects your minority because it doesn't allow for you to conduct business with only one or two people out of a board of 10 or 15. Only one main question can be on the floor at a time. And only one speaker can have the floor at a time. Otherwise, it's going to be much like Thanksgiving dinner when everybody's around the big table, or at least hopefully we will be this Thanksgiving, and everybody's talking at the same time, and there's lots of conversations going on, which is great for Thanksgiving, not so great when you're having a meeting. So you want to have some control over, over that. So you can pay attention to what's actually being acted on. Debatable motions must receive full debate. And so um, you, you just you have it until everybody you know, has said their piece and everybody's comfortable. You don't use personal remarks during debate. If there's an item out there that a particular board member or member of the organization has championed and brought forward and maybe it's not a very good idea but you don't you debate the idea you don't shame the person that brought it this is like, what a stupid idea you know you, you debate whether it's good or bad but you don't say anything about the person that brought it forward and then a question which is a motion you've decided something you don't bring it back again in the same manner, in the same form, except by reconsideration. This is one that's very tricky and not used very often, but occasionally you, you decide something and then people think about it and then they realize, well, that's, that's just not going to work or, you know, we did something that we just can't do. And so you need to reconsider that. But it's something you'd want to definitely talk with your parliamentarian if you have one, if you have legal counsel, if you're a city council, on how to make that happen, how to bring that back before the board. Most of the time, you just need a majority vote to decide something, but sometimes a greater number is, um, is required, particularly if you are going to um, take something away from the members. So if you decide that um, you want to, um, your rules say that everybody can debate, you know, can speak and debate twice. Well, you have a really long agenda. So you decide that you're going to change the rules just for this meeting, which you can do to say, okay, everybody can only speak once in debate. Well, you're, you're taking something away from your members. And so that motion to do that, first of all, it has to be a motion in a second. And you have to have a super majority. You have to have more than a majority to agree to do that. Two thirds vote. That's not, that's when you need a higher vote. And then silence gives consent. If you don't vote, you just give your consent to the decision made by the group. This is not the same as abstaining. You would abstain for something from something if you have a, 
another interest and it's going to benefit you personally, then you're not going to vote on it. But if you just decide not to vote, in many cases, you don't have to. But if you do that, then you're just saying, I agree to go on with whatever the majority is going to do. I agree to go with that. So let's talk about how you get something in front of the group. You make a motion, a main motion. I think we're all very familiar with this. People say things like, I make a motion to do something. So you address the chair, that's who you make the motion to. You'll be recognized and then you make the motion and then someone seconds it. And then the chair, you know, it's, it's a back and forth. And then the chair states the question or states the motion. So that's how you get it in front of the, you know, in front of, in front of the group. Now, once it's out there, so now you've got this motion out there, so now you got to do something with it. So the first thing you're going to do is you're going to debate it. Now, it may be that it doesn't need any debate. It's a slam dunk. It's an easy thing. There's no, there's no, nothing to talk about. You just want to vote on it. So if there is no debate, um, then the chair puts the question to a vote and says, you know, are you, you know, the, the chair would, you know, are you all ready to vote? And then you, you vote. However it is that you vote, you either raise your hand, you say aye or nay, you know, whatever you're doing. And then the chair announces the result. If there is debate, then you begin to debate the motion using your, the rules and everybody gets their chance to say something. And then once the debate is concluded, then you have the vote and then you announce the results. So this slide has a lot of information on it, but when it appears that the debate is ended, the chair should ask if, if everybody is ready for the question. And that's, that's the question from the chair. Is everybody ready? That's your time. If you really have something else to say, this, it's your time to jump in there to debate again. If nobody says anything, then the chair will assume that it's time to vote and they'll restate the question and then you're ready to vote on it. So there's a, a couple of nuances in here that might be helpful. Uh, the question is pending when it's been stated by the chair, but it hasn't been voted on. So it's right there. And then the last motion stated by the chair is the first motion pending. And that's when you're amending something. You've got a motion out there to do something and someone wants to amend it. So you have to vote on the amendment first and then vote on the, the main motion. And then the main motion is always voted on last. The chair's wording of a motion when it's put to a vote is the definitive motion to be included in the minutes. And that's the version. So if the chair has misstated your motion, you need to correct the chair. You need to get their attention and say, that is not what I said. And if it truly is misstated. And then the chair should always, always ask for negative motions, even if the vote appears to be unanimous. And especially if you're in a large group, you may want, you always want to ask for any, any negative, just to make sure because someone could be voting in opposition to it and they want to have that recorded. I'm not going to read this to you. It's in the presentation. The, an effective chair presiding officer, there's a lot of things that you want to do if you are chairing or you're the presiding officer of a group. And, um, you know, start the meeting on time. You know, prepare for the meeting, things like that. So I've got some things for that one. And the last one's really important, the sense of humor, because things happen in meetings. You know, microphones fall over. Um, you know, technology doesn't work. You've just got to have a good sense of humor in order to keep the meeting going along. And you have a lot of duties as the presiding officer. You've got to be organized. That's where your well-prepared agenda comes in handy. Uh, be prepared. Uh, you need to be familiar with the rules. Uh, be a mentor and explain things to the group. And especially if you're a chair and you have a new member join that really doesn't know what the, the common rules are. They've never been a part of your board before. You know, explain things to them. You're impartial and you're precise and you're courteous, but it is the chair's job to maintain control. And if you're a board member, if you're a member of this organization, you've got some things to do as well. You've got to be committed to the mission. You've got to attend as many meetings as possible. You know, you pull your own weight, but be prepared to ask tough questions. You know, you're there, you know, you were either elected to the board or you joined it because you really believe in the organization and you need to be prepared to ask those hard questions and, um, and do your homework and get ready, be prepared for the meeting. All right, so let's talk about the agenda. 
as I said, that's your roadmap and it's a really key part of your whole process. It's the actions that should to be taken by the board. It needs to be easy to read and understand. So the people who are attending the meeting, they may not have any vote in the meeting, but they need to understand what you're going to do. It needs to be newsworthy to all members. Um, I put on there, it accurately meets open meetings or openness requirements, depending on what state you're in and what kind of board it is. There may be some requirements that, you know, things be stated very clearly. You don't use, use terms like old business or new business, and then you don't list anything under them. You know, you put out there exactly what it is you're going to do. Uh, there's some definitions of an agenda. Um, it's a memorandum of things to be done as items of business or discussion to be brought up at a meeting. That's what we all pretty much understand. Roberts has a little bit more fancy definition. Uh, it's a predetermined sequence of items of business to be covered in a specific meeting. It's also known as the order of business. So preparing an agenda is to provide a guide to the people running the meeting, but it's also notice to all of your members that are out there. Uh, and, you know, about what you're going to do, when you're going to do it, and what place you're going to do it at, the time, date, and place. So what are all the pieces to this agenda puzzle? First of all, you got to figure out who's going to be responsible for preparing it. Sometimes it's the board secretary. It could be the president or CEO, the board chair, or some group of, the, you know, maybe all three of them work on it. Or the secretary prepares it, and it's approved by the others. So how is this determined? Sometimes you've adopted rules of procedure that say, you know, the, by the second day of the month, the secretary is going to prepare the agenda. And then by the 10th day of the month, the, the president's going to approve it and it'll be distributed to the members no later than five days before the meeting, something like that. Or it could just be this is the way we've always done it. The secretary's always prepared it and the uh, president's approved it. And that's how we've always done it. So, if you get it in writing what the rules are, that's always really helpful. And then you need to determine who can put items on the agenda and how are they going to do that? How far in advance do they need to let you know? Who can do it? Can anybody in the organization put stuff on the agenda? Does it have to be vetted? You know, how, how does that work? You know, how, how, did that, how do those things get on the agenda? Okay, so if you're gonna put it together an agenda, um, you need to have a policy. It identifies when, you know, who's responsible, and it establishes your deadlines. This is really critical. You need to, you know, a deadline for getting a draft agenda. How do you revise it? Adding agenda items. Some deadline there. At some point, we have to just decide this is the final agenda, and then how are you going to post it? Where are you going to put it? And what's the deadline going to be for that? In organizations like cities and counties, they're going to be legal deadlines. You know, ours is 72 hours in advance. For other organizations, it may be a little softer than that, you know, uh, depending on what you're doing. If you have an item on there perhaps to amend your bylaws, it may have a very specific time period that you have to have that available to your members. But otherwise, it could just be, you know, no later than 24 hours before the meeting, you know, whatever your rules are. Most important, though, you want to review it and make sure that everybody's in agreement with the agenda as it stands and in the order <clears throat> and, and, how, and what your deadlines are. And also, if you're going to do a policy, have the entire board adopt the policy so they're all in agreement on this is how we're going to prepare and, and deal with our agenda. And then set up a lot of it in advance so that it's just really kind of a plug and play. You put things in, it's going to look the same every time, and it's, it makes it really easy as you um, transition from, you know, if your secretary is doing it from secretary to secretary. It's just really easy for the next one to just pick up and, and, and do your agenda, and, and you don't have a huge, um, you know, training curve. So the other piece of it, so you've got your agenda, which is that cover page, says this is all the things we're going to adopt. Well, the packet is the information that you're going to provide to those who are making the decision. So what's in it? But first of all, you need to ask, do we even need one? Not every time. It could be that some things are, you know, if you're having a special meeting for something that really there is no background, it's just going to be a discussion, there may not be anything other than the agenda. But then on some things, it may be, you know, if you're adopting your budget, well, then, you know, the draft budget may need to be in there. 
some sort of treasurer's report. Um, if you're having a neighborhood meeting, you want to have NPO crime reports or committee reports, any kind of background information, especially on something that's a hot topic. You know, you want to have a lot of background information, maps, um, you know, proclamations, you know, just anything that is going to be helpful to the people making the decision and to the people in the audience so they know what you're talking about. And then, um, you know, maybe upcoming uh, meeting or event dates. You just might have a sheet at the very end that just says our next meeting and here's some upcoming events for the organization. And then the third piece of it is the format of your agenda. Uh, you can do short captions, which are full short sentences describing each agenda item in a caption form. Or annotated is a little bit more than that. It's got a sentence and then some comments about the item, you know, sort of a uh, executive summary, if you want to call it that, and then perhaps even a recommendation that, you know, the, the finance committee recommends that the, the organization adopt the attached budget. You can have that included on your agenda if you choose to do so. And then the agenda document itself, so we're talking about now, it should say agenda. You should have the name of your association, the date of the meeting, and what kind of meeting are you having? Is it your regular meeting? Is it a special meeting? Is it an emergency meeting? Or is it a committee meeting? It's not the whole group, it's a smaller committee. And then where are you having the meeting? What room, what building name, street address? You know, so people know where to come to attend the meeting. And then what time are you meeting? What's the time of the meeting? And then, um, well, that slide didn't turn out very nice. Uh, you want to have a call to order, announce a quorum is present, any ceremonial matters at the beginning, and then your consent agenda, maybe the minutes of the prior meeting. Regular items. These are other items to be acted on by the board. And if you do have something that's a really hot topic, so everybody in the neighborhood is really interested in this. We lived in a lake community for a while um, down, in, uh, down by Huntsville. And um, we were surrounded by a lot of forest, but we had a lot of deer. And um, every year there was a discussion at the annual meeting of the Neighborhood Association about the deer. You know, do we have too many? Do we, have, do we need to, you know, cull the herd? Do we need to have them, you know, captured and, and move off to another area, you know, into the national forest or something? And that was always a hot topic because there, there was lots of people with lots of interest on both sides. And so you might want to put those early on the agenda so you can get those out of the way. And then if people are only interested in that and they don't want to stay for the rest of the meeting. And then you have your table postponed or continued items. Then you've got reports and then the date of your next meeting and then your adjournment. Oops. And then there's some other tips for your um, agenda format. Uh, just include as much information as possible in a succinct one sentence format. If on your consent agenda, use things like approve, authorize, accept, award, you know, action verbs like that. Uh, discuss in consideration or consideration of for your action items so people know that you're going to take action on those. And then be realistic when you're talking about how long is it going to take to talk about a particular item. And then um, make sure that everything's ready to go. As best you can. Sometimes once you get into the discussion or the debate, you realize, oh my gosh, this thing really isn't fully baked. We really need to postpone it and, and get more information. But try your best to not put something on that's, that's not really ready to go to the group. And I call this an ADA statement. Our city agendas here in, in Texas are required to have a statement on there about um, what accommodations we've made, you know, like where's the handicapped parking, that the room is accessible, is there a particular door someone perhaps in a wheelchair would need to go to, and it also talks about if you need a, assistance at the meeting, you know, maybe you need a translator or hearing assistance or anything like that, you know, who do you contact? But just in general, if you're having a neighborhood meeting or something else, you, it's a good practice to hold your meetings in a place that's accessible to those with mobility, hearing, or other issues. You don't wanna, you know, some rooms, if you're in their meeting, it's real echoey, and that makes it very hard for people with hearing aids. Um, some rooms, you really can't have a meeting in there if you don't have some sort of amplification people can't hear. 
So you want to just think about those things and make sure you have enough seating for everybody because it, you know, standing is, is really hard and um, people are going to get cranky if they have to stand too long. So you want them to be as comfortable as possible. And then an emergency meeting, um, you need to have a, a process for an emergency situation. Even in a neighborhood association, something could happen that you really do need, you know, to have an emergency meeting and you need to have a process for that. What is it going to be? You know, maybe it's an emergency expense that you're going to need to do, and you, but you need to get approval of everybody before you can do it. If you don't have bylaws or rules of procedure, you may want to adopt some just to cover this kind of situation. And, you know, you can also include, you know, who's going to put things on the agenda and how much notice do you need and things like that. And then your pending agendas, this would be something probably your board secretary would keep up with. Um, you just want to keep a date of your upcoming um, meetings and things that get continued or tabled uh, so you know what to do with them and where to put them. Something that got continued, okay, we're going to continue this till our August meeting. Well, someone needs to be responsible for actually going to the August agenda or, or the August agenda notes and say, oh, we got to put this item on here, you know, bring it forward. And you can also use it um, for certain things that you know are going to happen. You know, there may be specific reports that have to be presented to the board at the same time every year. Specific events, maybe your budget has to be adopted before the end of September. Um, officer elections. Uh, things like that. You know, maybe you um, have to have your annual meeting. You can have your meetings, your regular meetings, whenever you want to, but every year you have to have an annual meeting and it has to be in the third week of August. Well, you need to set up an agenda for that and calendar it and make sure that you have your, you know, everything else on that agenda that you need for your annual meeting. So you don't forget. And accessing it by the public and, you know, for cities and municipalities, obviously we have to make the agenda just as available to the public as we possibly can. We post it on the website. It's, it's available and it's it, and all of it is available. They can come by my office. They can, you know, there's lots of ways to get the agenda, but as your neighborhood association, you want to, you know, make it accessible to your members. Do you have a, you know, um, some sort of an official bulletin board? Do you have a website? You could put it up there. Do you have email for all your members? You could email them the agenda. Uh, maybe you can mail it to those who don't have email access. Do you have a community building? Can you post it there and say, well, you know, this is where it's going to be. Do you always meet in the same room? Maybe there's a way to post it outside the door. And just, you know, keep it standard so everybody knows where to find the agenda. You don't want people to say, well, I didn't know. You know, I would have been there to talk about the deer if I'd known, but I didn't know where the meeting was. So all of the pieces of that puzzle, you know, because there's a lot of pieces to an agenda, it gives you that big picture and how you can apply it to your board. Yours may not be nearly that complicated, but, you know, having a good process in place. So when you do have that hot item, that contentious item or that emergency, you're ready. You're ready to act on it. And just keep thinking about it and, and listen to the needs of your board members. Over time, things change. You know, maybe um, you're, Neighborhood is, is getting younger and folks really want their things to be presented to them electronically. But you also may have folks in your neighborhood that, you know, they really need it mailed to them. They're not going to, they they don't have an email address or they're not going to check their email, you know, but you need to be able to, to reach everybody with your agenda so that you have a, you know, have a good meeting and everybody's aware. Can't make them come to the meeting, but you can certainly make sure that they're aware of the meeting. And then we're going to talk a little bit about minutes. Now I'm the city secretary and I do, we do minutes here. So this is something that I'm very passionate about, but you need to have some standards for your meetings, your minute meeting, your meeting minutes, sorry, action only. That's what we do here at the city of Fort Worth. Some people sort of go with the anecdotal, which is the decision with a little bit of discussion or some go with verbatim, which is every single word is recorded. Don't recommend that. There's nothing wrong with it, but I don't recommend it. It's, first of all, it's a very time consuming. And then once people see 
verbatim, word for word, what they said. They're like, I didn't say that. And anyway, it could get ugly. So I recommend, I recommend decision only, action only minutes. But anecdotal is maybe a good compromise if, you know, between the two. Okay, at a minimum, your minutes should, you know, okay, who met? Who's, who's this group for? What date? What kind of meeting? Where's the location? Where were they meeting at? Who was there? Who was absent? Were there others present? You know, is there a sign-in sheet that you can attach to your minutes? You want to know who was there. You want to know who was there that made that decision. Because if someone was absent, if your board made some sort of decision and somebody is going to, in the worst case scenario, going to sue you for it, well, if the board member was not there, then, you know, they, it needs to reflect that so that they're not, you know, caught up in that. And you want to try to get the names of um, any people who spoke before the board. Uh, if you have a speaker card or a position cards or a sign-in sheet of some kind, that's very helpful. So you can, especially if you need to reach back out to them because they made some sort of a comment and you want to get more information or you want to thank them for their participation or that, you know, they had a really good idea and we want to implement that. And would they be willing to help you? You know, something like that. Any of your members who have a conflict of interest, you know, they're voting on maybe perhaps buying something, buying a piece of property. And one of your members, you know, is a part owner of that property. Well, then they have a con, they can't vote on that. They need to completely stand aside from that. But you need to have that in writing. What time did you adjourn? And then just a date saying when the, uh, the minutes were approved by the board. Okay, so that was a lot of information um, about you know, meetings and parliamentary procedure, but I think we've got time for some questions. Great. Yes, Mary, we do have a few questions. Um, there always is when I do this presentation. <laughs> I'm sure there is a lot, but I, I know everyone's really appreciating that all this information is available to them um, in the files tab. So, um, guys, if you do have questions for Mary, be sure to put them in the question, use the question tab. And remember, it's the person in front of the chalkboard looking like a teacher. Um, that really helps us so that we can make sure that we get to your question. So the first one is from Miss Rebecca, and she's asking, what is the usual percentage of the group of represents a quorum? That can depend. Um, if um, it's usually more than 50%, like if you have a board of of nine people, then most of the time you need five. You need five people there to be a quorum. But in some cases, um, you, your rules may say something different. So like the city of Fort Worth, we have to have six. And the reason we do that is because we have some items that require a super majority, which would be six or would be actually six people. Yeah, that would require, you know, you. you you want to have a quorum that if you have something that's going to require a super majority that you have enough people there. So it's, um, you know, it just depends on what your rules are, but that's why it's important that you determine what your quorum is going to be and, uh, and put that in your rules of procedure. So you know exactly how many people, and are you talking about uh, the number of people who are uh, like the makeup of the board? You know, it's, it's nine people total and it's, you know, you're going to say, okay, I want, I have to have five people present, but let's say one of your spaces is vacant. There's, there's no one in that seat, but does that count towards your quorum? Those are things that you need to, to um, work with um, your, your group and decide what you're going to do. But normally it's just, you know, whatever uh, it's 50% plus one, you know, so. so in that case, if it's nine, you know, more than half, that's what you're looking for. Okay, great. Okay, Ms. Ninfa asked, we assist neighborhoods get started and at times it's difficult to have them stay on point. Recommendations to keep them on track with Robert's rule of order. Well, the easiest thing to do is really is to make it simple and to just, um, I keep going back to rules of, of procedure that you adopt 
you, you can adopt Robert's rules as your as your go to, and then you can adopt adopt your own rules of procedure that say, okay, this is what our agenda is going to look like, and this is how we're going to make motions, and this is um, this is how you're going to get recognized. I mean, if you want to get down to that granular detail, and that way, um, it's just um, it's easy to do and. You don't want them to get down in the weeds of Roberts because that can make people get really antsy. And so it's really pretty basic as long as they do the, the motion making, as long as they understand how to make a motion and someone understands how to second it and then how to have your debate and then how to vote. And if they understand that and, you know, and, and you could do mock meetings and, and practice it and, and to help them understand. And then that will keep your meeting moving along. But those are the key things. How do I make it? How do I get recognized first so I can make a motion? How do I get recognized to make a second? And then how are we going to conduct our debate? And then at what point are we going to decide that, um, okay, we've debated enough. It's time to take a vote. And a lot of it goes to your chair. And your chair is the one that really kind of has to keep the meeting moving on, you know, moving along. Great. Um, I know that our office, NINFA, offers a training um, for new board members for neighborhood associations. And we um, briefly go over Robert's rules, but we do talk a lot about, you know, maintaining the room and the floor and making sure that um, the president is, you know, responsible and making, guiding through the, the meeting. So I'm um, more than happy to share that with you. Um, if you would like to, to look at it, you can send me a, a message and I can send that over to you as well. Okay, Ms. Eva asked, is it all right if we use the Roberts Rule of Order newly revised in brief by, and then it uh, says September 1st, 2020? Right off the top of my head, I don't know what the most recent version is, um, but uh, Roberts just did come out with a new version, and so there should be a new uh, Roberts Rules in brief that matches up with the new version and um, but I do think the 2020 is the right one because I, I got mine last year. So I think that is the right the right version. But yes, you absolutely can. And that is a little bit easier to read a little bit. And it's not nearly as intimidating. And there's also out there a number of Robert's rules for dummies and Robert's rules for I can't remember what the other one's called. And I trust I use those all the time because they're a lot. The explanations are a lot clearer. And then you can go back and look at Robert's and it will help you understand what they're trying to do, but it's a lot easier. Lots of good examples, really simple examples. Right. I saw somebody put one in the chat. I'll see if I can pin it so everyone can see it as well. Um, okay. Miss Margie says, is asking, is a motion needed to adjourn a meeting? No, it's not. Um, if there is no further business to come before the group, then the chair can just say exactly what I said. Uh, seeing no, no more, there's no more business to come before the group. We are adjourned. And they can just adjourn the meeting. So it's not it's not required. Great. Okay. So Ms. Dora asks, when there is an action item that needs to be voted by the members and there's no representation from some of the neighborhood association, what is the recommended action to take on that item? Um, is, oh yeah. Is that just the recommendation? Give me that again, Tabitha. Okay, so when there is an action item that needs to be voted by the members and there is no representation from some of the neighborhood association, what is the recommended action to take on to that item? Okay, so I think what she's asking is you've, you're, you've held a meeting, you've called a meeting, and one of the items on there, you really want representation from the whole neighborhood association. Mm -hmm. And, and you don't have it, you know, either nobody showed up for the meeting or only one or two people showed up for the meeting. If the item is really time sensitive, you just may have to go with what you've got. But if it is not time sensitive and can wait for you to have another meeting, that would be my recommendation is to, um, to postpone that item to a future date and, and say, we're going to handle it there. And also perhaps to, um, really work hard to get people out there to say, hey, we really want your input on this and nobody showed up at the last meeting. So please come to the special meeting that we're holding in three weeks to talk about this particular item and give them an opportunity to come and, um, and maybe explain to them why it's so important to have their, their um, 
their input and give them the, you know, another shot at it. But then if they don't show up at that second meeting, then I think you just have to go with what you've got. And, but you've, at least you can go back to, and if someone says, well, I didn't know, you could say, well, it was on the agenda for June. And then we postponed it to August to have another meeting and gave lots of notice and nobody showed up. And so we just went with the people that were there and you, you've covered yourself. Right. Really great advice. Okay. Shannon asks, can you change the local roles per meeting or does it need to be in your bylaws? Well, what needs to be in your bylaws is a way to suspend, it's called suspend your rules. So let's say that you have a rule in your um, bylaws that says, or in your rules of procedure that says that, um, uh, let's go back to the debate that says that you, everybody can, you know, maybe it says you can debate three times. You can speak three times for two minutes each. And you've got a really long agenda and you want to say, okay, we're only going to do it for two. You need to have a way to do that. So you would have a motion to suspend your rules for that meeting related to debate and you will only be able to debate two times, but it would require a motion and it would require a second and it would require a two thirds vote because you are reducing some of the rights of the members. So everybody has to agree to it, but you need to just have something in your, that allows you to suspend those rules because sometimes for timing purposes, um, you need to be able to, to do something quicker than you normally would. And uh, the city of Fort Worth and Tapitha could provide this to you if you ask her. Uh, our council rules of procedure are public and we have um, a section in there about suspending the rules and how that needs to happen. So, um, and we're happy to share, or you can email me directly and we're happy to share our rules of procedure that could be adopted for, or, or modified for any organization. Thank you, yes, yeah, so feel free to reach out to us. That's why the rules of procedure are really, really helpful. I mean, they don't have to be long. They could be three or four pages, but just anything that you have that says, this is how we're going to conduct our meetings every single time. But occasionally we're going to have to do something different and this is how we're going to accomplish that. And then everybody knows what the rules are. Yes, our board training, our board training does go over that, you know, some of the things keeping it simple and, and, tips on, you know, making the, sure the meeting flows um, and, and keeps everybody involved as well. Um, I don't know about you guys, but I've been to some unorganized meetings. <laughs> it's hard to get anything out of those sometimes. So, okay, there was another question um, in the chat from Shannon and I, uh, let's see, postponing indefinitely can be used against members who want to vote on a matter, but one or two people want to kill the matter. Isn't that called dilatory or am I saying that wrong? Dilatory. Yeah. Dilatory. Yeah. I knew dilatory, I would say yeah. it wrong. Um, Big words um, here. You know, we're getting kind of down into the weeds of Robert's rules, but um, you know, it's, I mean, someone can make a motion to postpone something indefinitely because they there's, and typically that's used when something is, it's just going to, there's just no good way to get out of it. Um, the best example is that I can think of right off the top of my head is, um, they, somebody wants to, they've put a name forward, uh, for someone to appoint a to a board and it, you know, for some reason that's just, it's, it's not going to, for any number of reasons, perhaps that person is not going to be the right person to appoint to, to this position. And if you vote them down, well, that makes everybody look bad, but if you approve them, they're just really not the right fit. And so there's just not really a good way to get out of that. And so someone could say, we're going to postpone the appointment of Joe Blow to the whatever board indefinitely. And that makes it go away because you really, you've not said no, you've not said yes, you've just pushed it away. And then maybe come back later with a different appointment or decide that it's just really not a good idea. You just don't really have anybody to appoint to that board. That's usually what it's used for to kind of sort of get people out without, you know, and causing any embarrassment to anybody. But, you know, if uh, someone makes that motion, it doesn't have to pass. I mean, someone has to second it and it has to, you know, it has to pass. And if it doesn't, then somebody that wants to actually vote on the item can make a motion to vote on it. So, you know, it's, um, it's not a done deal. Thank you, Mary. Let's see. Um, do you guys have any more questions for Mary? We have a few more minutes. 
Um, I did pin at the top of the chat, Mr. Alvin um, posted a booklet that he's used. Um, he says it's very short and simple. <laughs> There's a lot of good information out there about uh, Robert's rules and how to run good meetings. Mm -hmm. And um, and Tabitha is right. You really want your meeting to be very well run. You don't want to rush through things because you want people to have enough time to to take it in what you're talking about and you want to have good discussion. And it, there's no harm if you're the chair of a meeting and something is just going completely sideways to stop it and just say, okay, we need to regroup here. Let me talk to the secretary or to the parliamentarian and let's get us back on track. You know, that's a good chair to recognize, okay, this has just gone completely sideways and we need to get back on track. And so um, as a chair, you sometimes just have to put yourself out there and say, okay, hang on guys. Let's, let's circle the wagons, let's get back together and here's what we're gonna do. But since we do have a couple of minutes, let me run really quickly through something that you all may have seen at your meetings and I meant to include it in the presentation. It's when someone, uh, there's been a lot of discussion and it's gone on and on and on and on. And um, all of a sudden someone just jumps up and says, well, I mean, they don't jump up, but they jump up and say, I call the question, which is, um, you know, they're, they're wanting to stop the debate. Okay, that's a perfectly legitimate thing to do, but it does, it is a parliamentary action and it requires a motion in a second. You don't just suddenly stop talking and take a vote right then. The person that makes that has actually made a motion to essentially call the question. They want to, they, they want to stop debate and they want to vote. Now, they've got to have somebody second that. Someone's got to agree that that's a good idea. And then you have to vote on it. And it's also going to take a two thirds majority because you're in the middle of debate and someone wants to take that away. So, um, so if that happens in your meeting and you're chairing it, then you need to get a second for that. And if it passes with a two thirds majority, then yes, it is time to then vote on that item. Debate is ended. If it doesn't, then you just go right back into debate and right back where you started from. So I wanted to put that out there because that can sometimes happen and it's really not, um, uh, it can sneak up on you if you're not prepared for it. And the, the right answer is, I have a motion to call the question, is there a second? And if there isn't a second, then it is, it dies for lack of it and you just go right back into the debate. So I wanted to put that out there just in case that happens to you. Don't let somebody hijack your meeting by knowing what they think is the secret word to you know, get things moving on. Right. Okay. We did have another question come in. Doesn't the president have ultimate say in the outcome? Not all people are well versed in Roberts. The chair, yes, the chair can um, make decisions. Um, if someone is questioning the way something has happened, the chair can make a decision. But there's also a part of Roberts that allows for someone to challenge the chair and say, I think you're wrong. And so um, you, Yes, the chair is, you know, the, the chair really does have a lot of uh, power to make those decisions, but not every chair is perfect. And so um, it could be that they just honestly think they're supposed to do X and they really are supposed to do Y. And it is, a, someone needs to point that out if they've done it wrong. But yes, there, but there is a way to do that. But having, like I said, having rules about how you do your basic things, many um, smaller boards really don't get you know, really beyond making motions and seconds and, and things like that. But having something written down to help the chair is always a good idea. Yeah, perfect. Thank you so much. Um, let me look in the chat and see if there's anything else. I know we're almost done with time. Okay, Mindy asked, what do you say to stop that from happening? I think she might be referencing what you were talking about before. Um, oh, the call the question? I think so, yeah. If that's what it is. Yes, um, the, it's up to the chair to say, yes, there is a, and it's honestly just say, we have a motion to, to call the question or to stop debate and vote on this item. Is there a second? And that's the best thing to do. And then if someone seconds it, then you do have to go on with the vote. But if you're not sure that everyone understands what's happening, the chair can explain and say, what this will do is we will stop debating if this passes and we will vote on the item right now and just to make sure everybody understands. And sometimes that's the best way to, to make, to do that. And just to educate them about, you have to have a, you know, we have to have a motion and a second and a vote on this before it can take place. And it requires a two thirds vote. 
Okay, great. Okay, we're gonna have one more question. In a community meeting, if there is an action brought to the floor to vote, should the vote only be taken by those who are the elected NA members or can it include other persons in attendance? That's gonna go back to your rules of procedure on who, on, on what your different levels of membership are and what their rights mm -hmm. are. Certain members, you know, the board has the right to vote, um, you know, maybe, uh, I know an organization I belong to, it, the, the whole family belongs, but each family only gets one vote. So if my husband and I go, we only count as one vote, doesn't, you know, so mm -hmm. um, it just, it needs to be st uh, stated in your rules, you know, how that's going to work. But it would seem like the people in the, the neighborhood association would certainly have standing. Someone from another neighborhood association that has really no nothing to do with this, they just showed up because they thought it was interesting, maybe shouldn't be voting on it if it just applies to that one neighborhood. So that's where those rules of procedure come in handy. So you can yes. find who gets to vote. Yes. All, we're always referencing all of our neighborhood associations. What do your bylaws say? <laughs> that's, yeah. a, that's our favorite thing here to say in the office. <laughs> Yeah, bylaws and rules of procedure are uh, wonderful things. They're very hard to write, but once you get them, they're absolutely invaluable. Yes, for sure. Well, Mary, thank you so much for your time. Yeah. Thank you, all of you guys who joined us. I mean, isn't she amazing? She has so much knowledge about this and does it in a way that you can understand and gives great examples. So, friends, that's our last workshop session for um, NUSA today. Um, we're looking forward to tomorrow, but what we do have coming up at five is our neighborhood tours. And it makes me so sad that you're not here with us in person to go through our amazing neighborhoods and see some of these projects. But you are going to love um, getting to watch some great videos about some wonderful things that are happening in Fort Worth. Um, and so be sure to be ready to do that at five. And we, of course, if you don't join us then, we'll see you tomorrow in the morning. So thank you guys so much. And I hope that you have a great rest of your day. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Mary. You can come. I'll uh, check back tomorrow and see if there's any questions. Oh, yeah, that sounds great, Mary. Thank you so much for your time. You. We really appreciate it. Sure. Thank you. Bye-bye.